Coming up next on News Depth, around the world, Muslims are taking part in their Ramadan fast, and NASA's Ingenuity helicopter takes its first flight on Mars. We'll share about Ohio's important role in the Underground Railroad. Plus, you won't believe what dynamite discovery this kid made. News Depth is now. NASA makes its first flight on Mars. Hello everybody, I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you for joining us. Now, way back in February, we told you about NASA landing their newest rover, Perseverance, on Mars. Its mission is to search for signs of ancient life, collect rock samples, and practice technology for future robotic and human exploration. Past missions have been limited to rovers rolling around on the planet, but this mission takes it up a notch. Tagging along with Perseverance is a helicopter named Ingenuity. Ingenuity is, well, it's more like a drone, but the little guy will allow researchers to travel more freely about the planet's rocky terrain. Still not an easy task due to Mars atmosphere. An atmosphere is the layer of gases surrounding a planet. Our atmosphere is mostly oxygen and nitrogen. Mars atmosphere, on the other hand, is mostly carbon dioxide and is almost 100 times thinner than Earth's. It's also very cold. All this means Ingenuity needed to be extra light and work extra hard just to lift off the ground. Scientists just recently stretched the helicopter's wings for the first time. Michael Holmes has the story on this historic first flight. We can now say that human beings have flown a rotorcraft on another planet. It's the little helicopter with a very big mission. NASA's mini chopper named Ingenuity became the first aircraft to achieve powered, controlled flight on another planet. Beyond this first flight, over the next coming days, we have up to four flights planned and increasingly difficult flights, challenging flights, and we are going to continually push all the way to the limit of this rotorcraft. A short hop that is the culmination of many hits and misses. Ingenuity has so far survived the frigid Martian nights after separating from the Perseverance rover, relying on its solar-powered batteries to fire up internal heaters. But an initial spin test of its rotors delayed a scheduled flight attempt due to problems with a timer. NASA says the helicopter later successfully completed the test spinning its blades at 2,400 revolutions per minute, the speed it needs to take off. Scientists say having a bird's eye view of the terrain could revolutionize the way we study new planets. What the Ingenuity team has done is given us the third dimension. They've freed us from the surface now forever in planetary exploration so that we can now make a combination, of course, of driving on the surface and doing reconnaissance on inaccessible places for a rover. Flying on the red planet presented some difficult engineering challenges because of the low gravity of Mars and an atmosphere that is 1% the density of Earth's. NASA engineers sent along a good luck charm. Attached to ingenuity is a piece of fabric from the wing of the Wright Brothers flyer, which carried the first powered controlled flight on Earth. Thank you, Michael. Ingenuity took a second flight a few days after the first. At each additional flight, the helicopter will go faster and farther until it likely crashes, or the mission has to move its focus back to the Perseverance rover. Fun fact for you, the area on Mars where these test flights occurred has been named Wright Brothers Field. The Wright Brothers, you know, were the first people to fly an airplane successfully. That was way back in 1903 and took place in North Carolina, even though the brothers are from right here in Ohio. Well, today the Wright Brothers National Memorial marks the spot. The park recently welcomed a new type of technology for visitors to experience, a self-driving shuttle. Now, self-driving means able of moving on its own without a driver by using a computer program and sensors. Anthony Sabella has that story. From wings to wheels, Wright Brothers National Memorial is no stranger to firsts. First in flight a century ago and today... One, two, three. Another first. It's a, another Wright Brothers moment. Very exciting day in terms of the first pilot project of an autonomous shuttle in a national park. This is Cassie, connected autonomous shuttle supporting innovation. Autonomous, meaning it drives itself. For the next three months, it'll be shuttling memorial visitors around the park. 
and we were among the first. As you can see, there's always going to be somebody on board, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're always driving. For example, right now, Cassie is basically operating on its own. We're learning from this. I, I call it an experiment. David Halleck is the superintendent for national parks in eastern North Carolina. The National Park Service and North Carolina Department of Transportation partnered for the project, fronting the $150,000 cost to lease Cassie from developer Easy Mile. There's a number of sensors, um, LIDAR technology, GPS technology that work together um, to provide data to the vehicle so that it uh, can, can stay on the track that's been mapped. A three month trial testing the effectiveness and safety of self driving transit vehicles for future use. It's very, very likely that these autonomous shuttles, uh, several years from now or in a decade from now, uh, will be the norm and you're really seeing it start here today. Just as the Wright brothers changed history in 1903, potentially another day for the history books in Kill Devil Hills. Thank you, Anthony. Self-driving technology is becoming more and more common. One day we might all ride around in self-driving cars, and who knows, you might even get picked up in a self-driving school bus. Well, for this week's poll, we want to know how you would react to that. Head to our online poll to tell us how you'd feel about a self-driving school bus. You can choose from, I'm all for it, I'm not ready for that yet, or no thank you. Now, last week we asked you to vote on what spot you would most like to visit in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. 48% of you said you'd like to see Brandywine Falls. Nice. I have an update for you on a missing location that we mentioned earlier in the season. You remember we told you that researchers were looking for the home of abolitionist Harriet Tubman. Well, they found it. State and federal officials in Maryland made the announcement last week at the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Visitor Center in Church Creek. For the last year, archaeologists at the State Department of Transportation, State Highway Administration have searched the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge for a site where Harriet Tubman's father, Ben Ross, once lived. In November, they found signs that indicated that they were on the right track and a breakthrough occurred in March. Today, I'm excited to announce that our archaeologists have confirmed that this site was once the home of Ben Ross and may have been where Harriet Tubman spent her early years. The discovery comes after an archaeologist found a coin from 1808 along Maryland's eastern shore. Experts say that location is where Tubman, her parents, and siblings lived before she escaped slavery. Archaeologists found pieces of pottery, a button, and other artifacts in the area where Tubman's home likely stood. Between 1850 and 1860, Tubman used the Underground Railroad to rescue slaves from the South before the Civil War. Ohio played a big role in the Underground Railroad. Mary's got the history on it in this week's No Ohio. Mary? As Americans, we have so many things in our past to be proud of. Strong leaders, a history of innovation, and spirited people. But our history also includes some shameful practices, and perhaps the worst was slavery. Many states, both North and South, practiced slavery at one time. But by the 1800s, the practice was restricted to Southern states, where millions of people of African descent were bought and sold and spent their lives serving their captors. But the Underground Railroad provided slaves a way out. Interestingly, the Underground Railroad was neither underground nor a railroad. It was a network of secret routes and safe houses set up by abolitionists, or people who opposed slavery. Although there were underground railroad networks throughout the country, Ohio had the most active network of any other state. As a free state that shared borders with slave states Kentucky and Virginia, Ohio's location made it an ideal escape route. And many Ohioans were steadfast abolitionists who offered their own homes as safe houses for slaves. One abolitionist was Minister John Rankin of Ripley, Ohio, whose home stood on a hill that overlooked the Ohio River, which separates Ohio and Kentucky. Rankin would signal fugitive slaves in Kentucky with a lantern and let them know when it was safe for them to cross. Rankin helped about 2,000 slaves escape and is immortalized in Harriet Beecher Stowe's influential novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Other famous Ohio Underground Railroad conductors include a Cincinnati Quaker, Levi Coffin, and John Rankin's neighbor in Ripley. John Parker, a free black man. At its peak, the Underground Railroad ushered 1,000 slaves per year to freedom, and many of the Underground Railroad stops are still around today. 
In Cincinnati, there's even a museum dedicated to telling some of the stories of the Underground Railroad. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center sits on the bank of the Ohio River, where runaway slaves once took their first steps as free men and women. Thank you, Mary. Well, I'm digging these history stories, so how about we do one more? It doesn't take being a professional scientist to make a fascinating find from back in the day. Sometimes you just need to keep your eyes open to what's around you. That's just what a middle schooler in Colorado did, while on a recent hike, the boy made a, dare I say, dynamite discovery. He found the tooth of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, it was an exciting and rare find, not just for him, but also for the museum. Experts examined the tooth. Andrea Flores reports. I never expected anything like that. Eighth grader Jonathan Charpentier is the newest dinosaur discoverer for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It caught my eye, so I picked it up, but I had no clue that it would be a dinosaur tooth. He found this Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth while out on a hike in southeast Boulder County. I couldn't believe it at first. I thought there's really no way that it could be something that interesting. But something that I felt said, well, send an email to the museum and see if they can say anything about it. And then this was in, embedded in with the skull. So Jonathan yeah. turned the tooth over to dinosaur curator Joe Sertich. He says Colorado is prime T-Rex territory. Based on the area where this tooth came out, it's uh, what we call the Laramie Formation, which is between about 68 million and 68 and a half million years old. So it's about two and a half million years before dinosaurs go extinct. So this is one of the last dinosaurs that lived here in Colorado. Jonathan's discovery means a bigger dig for more dinosaur bones. It's going to probably kick off a lot of new research. So we're going to go back out to this area, maybe with Jonathan, and we're going to collect more bones. And hopefully there's more of a T-Rex out there waiting for us to, to dig it up. Now a part of undigging Colorado's history, Jonathan has some advice for other people who like to get outdoors. Be on the lookout for these things because you really can find them anywhere. Thanks, Andrea. The tooth will stay at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. The museum says it will always be credited to Jonathan, as will any other discoveries it leads to. Well, picking up a dino tooth is pretty cool, but picking up litter can make a lasting impression for the animals who are alive right now. That's what we're going to learn about in this next story. The pandemic has resulted in a lot of difficult to recycle materials heading to landfills, especially that personal protective equipment or PPE. Think about used masks and old gloves, etc. Bill Weir has details on how the healthcare industry is hunting for creative solutions to a messy problem. Bill? In the early days of COVID, the dire shortage of PPE left many frontline healthcare workers painfully vulnerable. But now, so many masks are made each year, they could cover an area the size of Switzerland. Now everybody is aware of PPE, and everybody in healthcare is being asked to use more PPE. We now have almost 70,000 people to potentially use a mask every single day. So the number of masks that we needed went from 200 operating theaters and some patient floors to literally 70,000 a day. That's from one hospital, adding to an already staggering amount of plastic waste coming from our healthcare system. We estimate that it's somewhere around a million tons per year of clean plastics. And that's a million tons per year in the U.S. We're estimating that's probably equivalent in Europe and probably about the same amount in Asia. Unfortunately, today, I would say probably the majority of it is still going to landfill. Landfills, if we're lucky. The Ocean Conservancy collected more than 100,000 pieces of PPE during the second half of 2020 alone. And that is just a tiny tip of a mountain of pandemic plastic waste. Manufacturers went into overdrive to produce billions of pieces of PPE. Things like gloves, things like garments, things like masks, beard nets, hair covers, shoe covers. Personal protective equipment has always been around, but due to COVID, it's, it's now a monster waste stream. Programs offered by private recycling companies like TerraCycle are taking aim at the discarded consumer PPE, but contaminated materials like those coming from hospitals aren't as simple to process. Waste coming from certain areas like hospitals does qualify as hazardous waste in many cases, which means legally, from a regulatory standpoint, we can't touch it. 
recyclers are afraid to take materials from hospitals because maybe there's a syringe in there. Something came in that wasn't supposed to and they didn't catch it in time and they had to shut down their whole plant and disinfect everything. Recycling is really third on the hierarchy when it comes to dealing with waste. The first is to reduce the use of plastic, second is to reuse, and then the third is to recycle. It's a situation that has forced the Cleveland Clinic to rethink and look for other ways to reduce their plastic footprint. We found a local company of Cleveland Whiskey that started making sanitizer for us. We bottled that sanitizer and sent it out to every facility every day. And we now have a combination of both glass and plastic containers where we're refilling these things constantly. We started a collection early on of the PPE that we could re-sterilize, the N95 masks and some other gowns and personal protective equipment. And nobody ever imagined <laughs> that that was even a possibility. We've also been trying to innovate. I mean, we're building a process to actually turn those lower value plastics that we can't recycle into fuel. We went and found seamstresses in the city of Cleveland, and we sourced a really good cloth material, and we actually produced cloth masks. As masks help fill our landfills all the faster, the flow of plastics into our oceans is expected to triple by 2040. More than two thirds of UN member states have said they'd be open to a Paris style agreement that might stem the kind of pollution now found in every link in the food chain. The US so far has been notably silent. Thanks Bill. Well, thinking about our responsibility to take care of the earth brings me to your answers to the question we asked you last week. We ask you to represent the earth in a piece of art for Earth Day. Let's see what you sent in by opening up our inbox. Here's a drawing from Tavon at J&G Snow School in Berea. Tavon wrote, I would draw Earth as healthy in a piece of artwork. I believe she is healthy because I see a lot of green and blue. During spring, I see a lot of new plants. This is why I would draw Earth as healthy. Leah from Claggett Middle in Medina sent this painting. I would use watercolors to paint a tree with bright green leaves because when I think of the earth, I think of the nature that makes the earth thrive. Luke from Orville Middle in Orville wrote, I would represent earth in a piece of art by making clay pottery and wrapping it in plastic bags to show that they are harming the environment and wrapping it around the pot would represent that they are taking over the ocean because of littering and the pollution. Lila from Westlake Elementary in Westlake wrote, I have very little to say, but I drew a picture of what I think the Earth will look like in one year. There is a newspaper in my art, and you might not be able to read it, but it says the tiger is extinct, the panda is extinct, the fish are dying, we have killed the Earth. Normally I'm pretty optimistic, but the way we are treating the Earth, I can't see anything good for our future. Liliana from Independence Primary and Independence wrote, I would love to represent the blue and green side because it is full of pretty nature and lakes and oceans to take a swim with the sharks and fish. It is pollution and trash free. It has super healthy air to breathe with paths to run, walk, bike, or scooter on. The brown side, it is full of trash, pollution, and fires. This is what Earth could become if we do not take care of it. Let's keep the Earth green and blue so we can all be proud to represent it. Very creative, everybody. Love the colors, too. Well, around the world, Muslims are celebrating Ramadan. Ramadan is a month of fasting and prayer by people of the Muslim faith. It's a time for them to reflect on their relationship with God, and it ends with a big feast called Eid al-Fitr. This year, the holy month runs from April 12th through May 12th. Stephanie Lynn reports on how Ramadan is taking place with pandemic restrictions and how Muslims are being encouraged to get vaccinated, especially as they gather for prayer this month. Stephanie? Imam Amr Dabur leads his congregants through evening prayer. This month, significant for millions of Muslims around the world, celebrating their second Ramadan during a pandemic. Here in Sacramento. The goal is, like I said, to connect, better connect with God and better strengthen your spirituality spirituality and soul. Congregants at the Sacramento Area League of Associated Muslims carefully worship under public health guidelines. Allah. Wearing face masks and going through socially distanced motions of prayer, each person also using their own individual prayer mat. 
This is a special month for the Muslim community to show the uh, Sacramento community how uh, peaceful this religion is. Uh, it's not what they hear in the media. It's not what some individuals do. Fasting, a part of Ramadan tradition, meaning nothing can enter the body between sunrise and sunset, raising the question of whether getting the COVID-19 vaccine for this community could be delayed. The vaccine is 100% okay to take even while fasting. The imam tonight joining other religious leaders of the Muslim faith in supporting congregants to get vaccinated. It's all about nutrition. The vaccine is not a nutrition. It doesn't qualify. Adding most of his congregants have already taken steps to get their shots. Yes, I did the first one last two weeks and I have another one tomorrow. I do plan on getting it pretty soon whilst I'm fasting. This 18 year old telling us she's looking for an appointment as soon as one opens up. Yes, 100%. Opportunity presents itself, I'll take it. We should be more encouraged to take the vaccine since we want to come to the masjid and do the prayers and there will be a lot of gathering. So it's our responsibility to take our part. The message that Ramadan brings us as Muslims this year is a message of hope. Hope of better days to come as California continues to reopen. And as an additional safety measure, the center here does require everyone who chooses to enter for prayer indoors get a temperature check. Reporting from Sacramento, Stephanie Lynn. Thank you, Stephanie. The Sacramento Area League of Associated Muslims is also holding virtual online services every night for people who want to worship and stay in their homes. Well, from a religious celebration, let's turn to a school celebration. An Oklahoma elementary school is clapping for one of America's newest citizens. The school's beloved lunch lady and her family took the oath of U.S. citizenship recently. It was an emotional experience for her and all the children she helps feed each and every day. Petrina Agger has the story. It's lunchtime at Prairie Vale Elementary. Cafeteria manager Yannette Viamontes Lopez and her team preparing chicken nuggets for these little ones. An immigrant from Cuba, Yannette moving from Houston a few years ago with her family for better job opportunities. When I was a child, I had a dream, like say Martin Luther King, <laughs> right? My dream was come here to this great country. One dream fulfilled Monday. Yannette passing her test to become a U.S. citizen. The children lining the hallways to celebrate her big accomplishment. All the students give me hug. United USA was exciting. I was crying like a baby, and the teacher were crying. Yannette, not the only one passing the test, but her whole family, including her husband and three children, ages 17 to 28. I know everything about the United States, Constitution, President, everything. It's amazing. I know. I learned a lot of history because I love this country. She is just a joy to have on my staff. Principal Michelle Anderson says watching these kids cheer for the woman who cares so much about them brought tears to her eyes. I was crying, she was crying, all the teachers were crying, and we were just so proud of her. And I think mm. it means more to us than anyone because she's our, part of our family. Yannette encouraging everyone to go after their dream, no matter how hard it may be. Thanks, Petrina. For this week's write-in question, we want you to tell us about a school employee who's made a difference in your life. They could be like that, a lunch lady, or it could be a teacher or a coach. Speaking of writing, you know a student who's an excellent writer? Our A-plus winner this week, seventh grader Alex LaSala from Avon Middle School. He won the seventh grade competition of the 2021 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Art, Essay, and Multimedia Contest. The Ohio Civil Rights Commission held the competition for all Ohio sixth through 12th graders, and only one winner was selected from each grade. Now, students could write an essay or create a multimedia project or a piece of art. The students were to ask themselves, when you were faced with a challenge or a setback, what did you do? How did you keep moving forward? Alex wrote an essay about finding seventh grade a lot harder than sixth grade. He plays a lot of sports and has had to balance his extracurriculars with more complicated schoolwork. In the essay, Alex wrote, Now my honors math homework takes so many steps to finish one problem, which used to take me only a few seconds to finish a problem. This is totally different for me, and it scares me. I have never been challenged like this before. As part of his project, Alex also made some great artwork that displayed him as a student with a packed schedule. 
Alex comes from a family of artists. His grandmother is an artist and his mom, Megan, is a graphic designer. She says Alex has watched her do graphic design work on a computer all of his life. So he took some of that knowledge and his love for computers to move his drawings onto the computer and turn them into creative PDF files. Now, Alex says now that he's further into the school year, he feels better about seventh grade. It was a challenge at first, but Alex has adapted to the changes and is used to more demanding schoolwork. One more note, Alex only participated in the competition because he'd get extra credit points in one of his classes, and his mom convinced him it was worth it. So well done, Alex LaSala. We're excited to award you this week's News Depth A Plus for doing that extra credit assignment and for facing the challenges of doing something new. I think that's something we can all relate to. Great job, buddy. Okay, I think we've given her long enough to find a story. Let's see what Newscat has pawed up for us in this week's Petting Zoo. <coughs> hey there, Newscat. You're gonna recycle that newspaper when you're done, right? Okay, good. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 she's found something. Aha, it's a story about soaring chicken sales in California. To find out about the popular pandemic pets, click the petting zoo button on our website. Thank you, Newscat. No drumsticks for dinner, okay? Okay, guys, that's going to wrap it up for us, but not before I say we want to hear from you. And there are plenty of ways to stay in touch. You can write to us. We're at 1375 Euclid Avenue. That's Cleveland, Ohio. Our zip code, 44115. You can email us at newsdepth at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. Our handle is at newsdepthohio. Plus, you can catch all of our special segments on YouTube. And if you're old enough, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our new videos. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Rick Jackson. We'll see you right back here next week. New Steps is made possible by a grant from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation.